thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm here with John Matonis, who um, in the Bitcoin world, everybody knows him. Um, in the FT world, maybe not so much. Um, so I will briefly introduce him as someone who has been, who has played a pivotal role, I would argue, in popularizing Bitcoin and in sort of preaching the cause of Bitcoin and generally um, um, getting everyone to know about it. Um, he's here, however, because he recently became kind of front page news in a, in a strange way because he was closely involved in um, trying to identify uh, who Satoshi Nakamoto is, the, um, the pseudonymous founder of Bitcoin itself. But um, before we get to that, I actually wanted to talk to John more about some of the stuff that we here in the FT and outside of the kind of Bitcoin uh, bubble, I would argue, don't um, necessarily know about so much, which is the roots of this whole phenomenon. And I'm not talking about the foundation myth of Satoshi. I'm talking about where this stuff emerged from. And um, there's been a lot of uh, books written about Bitcoin, but they don't really get to the core point here, which is this so-called cypherpunk movement. So let's start off very quickly, um, not quickly, very, take your time, sorry. <laughs> In the initial phase, let's start off with uh, John. How did you come into this entire weird world of Bitcoin and of cypherpunks? When did you, you're, you you've told me before, you're not, a, you're not a cypherpunk, but you were very closely sort of involved in that area. So tell us a little bit how you um, perceive that entire movement. Sure, sure. Um, it's interesting that you bring up Bitcoin because Bitcoin does have, uh, owes a lot of its roots to the, to the cypherpunk movement. And uh, uh, people at FT tell me that you're not so much of a Bitcoin fan, but I brought you a Bitcoin today so that now you can have one for yourself. <laughs> okay, now I have to declare my interest. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's actually just a doubloon, so don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> oh, thank you, John. Um, with my, myself and cypherpunks is it, an interesting story because I actually started um, that journey at RSA Data Security when they were starting to spin out a company called Digital Certificates International. Uh, later, that company became VeriSign. Um, and there were a group of about 10 or 12 people that spun that group out of RSA Data Security VeriSign originally uh, was responsible for the issuing the digital certificates that uh, was able to, to jumpstart SSL in the early days with uh, the SSL protocol from Netscape uh, with, with Tahir El Gamal and, and others. And it was that um, certificate and that partnership between Netscape and VeriSign and RSA um, that actually created SSL for better or worse. I mean, SSL has a lot of problems. The, the entire uh, internet security structure has a lot of problems, and the the main reason that it has a problem is because the certificate revocation list never really followed through from the original vision. So now you have secure internet connections we're all familiar with. We see the padlock uh, when we're using the web and online banking, but you know the, the those certificates now can essentially come from anyone. Um, and the root keys have been deployed in many different browsers. Uh, th there's attempts to remedy this, uh, and, and, and we're starting to see that emerge now. Um, but that, that was my introduction to it. Eventually, leading after VeriSign, I also uh, worked with the people at Hushmail. And Hushmail uh, is a end-to-end -end encrypted email solution uh, operating today in Vancouver, uh, but originally operated out of Ireland uh, because it had to have non-U.S. developers operating outside of the U.S. Um, and that's, that's basically my inroads uh, to the cypherpunk movement. So tell us a little bit, like for, li literally, because we're newbies. We don't know this weird world. Um, what's the philosophy about? Well, you can think of the, the word cypherpunk is a strange uh, combination of, of cyberpunk with C-Y-B-E-R, and then the word cipher merging together uh, as cypherpunk. Um, it goes, there's, there's several books written about cypherpunks and, and the internet and privacy. The, the main goal is that to use cryptography to protect your privacy and advance your interest of privacy. The, the group was formally launched by uh, three individuals, uh, Tim May, 
uh, Eric Hughes and uh, John Gilmore. Uh, John Gilmore eventually became uh, or was uh, one of the early employees of Sun Microsystems, uh, one of the founders of EFF. And this was in 1992. So the Cypherpunks launched in 1992 basically on a mailing list um, with you know, 100 to 500 subscribers on a mailing list to write code. Cypherpunks uh, write code. And to be a cypherpunk in that early group, you, you essentially were a developer. Um, it's later become a, a, a broader term to include a, a larger group of, of self-defined individuals that are advancing privacy protocols uh, through the use of cryptography, sp specifically public key cryptography. But t tell us maybe a little bit more about what was their, con like, what, why were they doing this? What, what were they concerned about? What was the uh, agenda really here? Yeah, the, um, that, that's, that's great uh, reference point because the, the technical roots, the technical heritage leading up to 1992 was essentially uh, the work of David Chom uh, in, in the late 80s, the mid to late 80s. Uh, David Chom was a developer mathematician from the Netherlands uh, responsible for uh, several electronic money privacy protocols, uh, blind signatures, and uh, also the founder of DigiCash. Now, this is a very important part of the history because with DigiCash, you were essentially setting up anonymous electronic money, very much uh, a, a precursor to the ideas of Bitcoin, but you had the one limitation of a centralized issuer. So in, in the DigiCash system, you, you always had to go and rely on a centralized mint to reissue your, your DigiCash tokens. And this, this centralized structure became uh, one, of its, one of its weak points. And just, ju just like BitTorrent was a reaction to um, uh, the, the, the crackdown on Nabster, you could almost say that um, uh, Bitcoin was a reaction to the, the crackdown on, on centralized money issuers, uh, centralized uh, digital money issuers. So the, the genesis of the cypherpunk movement, and, and people have built upon this, the, uh, the cypherpunks today are really people in their 50s or 60s. So, uh, you know, much older group, and even a much older group uh, than uh, the, the creators of Bitcoin, um, in, in my opinion. So it, it, a reaction to that, um, or are they? Sorry. <laughs> a reaction to that to that centralized <laughs> issuing um, is is eventually what led to to Bitcoin and the protocols used in Bitcoin. Some of the protocols used in Bitcoin um, came from from well-known cypherpunks like uh, Hal Finney and uh, Adam Back. So there's, I would argue, as an outsider, completely that there is this romanticized. Uh, sort of perspective of it all, uh, within the Bitcoin community especially, that you know there was a perception that Bitcoin would have come from this movement because there was this key concern about privacy, and um, they were kind of fighting for people's privacy. Is that fair? Is that a fair um, uh, statement by Well, it's, it's, it's more than just, um, it, it is. It's based around privacy, but uh, uh, anonymous email, digital signatures, and electronic money were, were basically the, the, the core functions. So let's now pivot as they do in Techland. Um, is someone called Craig Wright from that sort of heritage? Uh, I and believe Craig Wright, for those who do not know, has been um, recently as very closely linked with the identity of Satoshi Nakamoto. In fact, John Matonis came out to endorse him as the likely creator of Bitcoin. Uh, we'll get into the details of that um, now, uh, but let's start with, does, does Craig Wright, as you met him and knew him, um, did he come from that school? Um, I, I do know Craig Wright personally. He, he lives here in London uh, for the moment. And as, as Isabella knows, uh, since she broke the story on it, um, uh, there, there was originally going to be uh, something at the London School of Economics regarding that, which turned into a different type of, uh, uh, of an announcement. Um, Craig uh, is much younger than what the 1980, 1990 cypherpunks would be like. Um, and he, he built upon that work. So uh, of course he could be called, he could, he could be a self-described cypherpunk, but he would not be in that same original group. Um, you know, so think of it the, the way you would think of um, you know, Moxie Marlinspike who developed a, a Signal, the, the mobile app for, 
uh, secure phone messaging and, and secure voice. Um, he built upon that work. Now, Bitcoin was launched, uh, uh, the, the white paper was launched on a cryptographer's mailing list where these people were, um, and Hal Finney was one of the very first people to download uh, the, the Bitcoin, the original Bitcoin core protocol, and start playing around with it. So obviously, the, the work that Hal contributed back, um, it, he gets credit for, for being an early developer uh, of Bitcoin. So um, perhaps best to um, expand this as follows. So. What was your experience with this whole Craig situation? I mean, tell us, um, the London Review of Books um, recently published a story by Andrew, by Andrew O'Hagan, and it told a very long, like, um, long-winded, I was 35,000 words worth of uh, uh, insights into this entire, like, um, uh, proof of uh, identity uh, episode with Craig. Tell us your involvement, how you came across Craig in the beginning, um, and what you still think today with respect to everything that went on. Right. <clears throat> That's a big question, but... <laughs> yeah, I thought I'd put it... I'd let you say it I, in your own words because I don't want to put words in your mouth. Um, I, I am not trying to be, and I never wanted to be, a, a Bitcoin disciple or a disciple of Craig Wright, a, a disciple of Satoshi. Um, but with transitive trust, you're, you're in this situation. And uh, so, so that's, that's where I find myself. Um, there are certain aspects that I have had access to, certain evidence that I've had access to that uh, the general public has not had access to, so I'm, I'm comfortable with, with my statements. I haven't changed anything around my blog post. I haven't done any retractions on that. Um, and Craig himself will also, uh, he, even though he comes across as a little strange on camera, he, he never himself wanted to be outed either. And he's very humble in terms of uh, the credit for, for Bitcoin. Uh, if you notice in some of his public discussions, as well as the private discussions that, he, that he's had with me, um, you know, he, he credits uh, people like uh, uh, Dave Kleiman uh, as a partner, um, maybe for reviewing the white paper, not so much on the coding side. Uh, he credits people like uh, Gavin Andreessen and Mike Kern. Um, so he recognizes it as, as, as a shared um, development and and he is very humble about it. So, the article that came out, thirty five thousand words uh, in the in the London Review of Books. Um, I, I knew Andrew O'Hagan because he had been he had been interviewing players in this going back almost a year, and I spent uh, quite a bit of time with him during during the London proof sessions. And um, I I don't think there's any inaccuracies in, in that article. Um, and I had very good experience with Andrew. Did you think it was weird that there was so much sort of media management of the whole thing? Did that strike you as in any way strange, or is that normal in the Bitcoin world? I'm just curious. Well, it, it would have been strange if it was uh, Craig Wright wanting to do it on his own as Satoshi, but uh, what the article from Andrew O'Hagan reveals is that it was actually corporate interests that were behind uh, Craig Wright um, that were actually stage managing this. And it had a lot more uh, to do at a corporate level, uh, enterprise-wide, than it did with just one individual coming out as Satoshi. So the stage management was really, it, it, when you look at it in that context, it doesn't seem that strange because it was only one component of a broader strategy that, uh, that hasn't even been revealed yet. Fair enough, uh, but some might say that if he wanted, I'm playing devil's advocate at this point, um, some might say that if he just wanted to prove his identity, he could have done it very simply and without a lot of the, um, uh, even from a corporate, like with the corporate interests, he could have just done it without the big media hoopla. Right, but he, he essentially never really wanted to reveal his identity, so he had been trying to avoid that at, at all steps along the process. And it, it's also fair to say that the relationship that uh, Craig had with this company, uh, Encrypt, um, no longer exists. I mean, the company is still there, but uh, Craig's involvement um, is, is, is no longer uh, relevant. He, he is, he's severed ties with them because this component um, was not able to complete the, the corporate strategy for them. 
So um, recently, the B, uh, Reuters, I believe, reported that there have been a lot of patents filed by Craig, but, but in the form of this uh, company, I presume. Um, does explain to me this logically, because I'm not in the tech space at all, and I seem to have a. I have trouble understanding how a um, technology which is supposed to be open source and open protocol with, you know, available for the masses, uh, is now being patented by someone like Satoshi, because that seems to strike me as a monetization tool. And like you and I have discussed before, that really the corporate interests that are trying to monetize it are the private banks now by way of the blockchain. So is this about protection for Bitcoin, or how do you, ju how, how do you square that? <clears throat> how do you square that circle? Um, exactly. Well, personally, I am against uh, uh, software patents. I mean, they, they, they reduce innovation in the space. Um, and when people say that they're, getting, they're taking out things for defensive reasons, um, it's really in the eye of the beholder whether they're holding it for a defensive patent. So you really have to dig behind the covers and see, uh, is this really for defensive purposes? Um, the intellectual property that was created by Craig Wright was turned over to the, to the enterprise, to the corporation. Um, so it, it's, it's no longer uh, technically owned by Craig. Now, on the decision of what to open source versus what not to open source, um, that's going to be a strategic decision in terms of which open protocols will benefit the, the, the spread and proliferation of, of the new technology that's behind it. I mean, we're talking about a portfolio of between 400 and, and 700 uh, patents that, that aren't even fully completed yet. And we haven't heard the last uh, uh, of this company because the, the overall plan is to build an enterprise that is effectively a counterbalance to something like Blockstream. Uh, and Blockstream in the market today uh, is, is where a majority of the Bitcoin core developers sit in, in Canada. Uh, it's it's Austin, one of Austin, Austin Hill's latest company. Um, so we haven't heard the end of this, and it, if it's successful, it will go well beyond just being a Bitcoin blockchain company. It'll be, it, it has the potential to be um, an enterprise finance, enterprise slash finance, healthcare, everything kind of company um, on the level of uh, uh, something like Oracle or Microsoft. But there is a very explicit sort of ownership uh, sort of attempt here, or, uh, is, isn't there? Like in terms of, well, I mean, the, it doesn't belong to the people anymore if that happens. No, or? there's there's an attempt. Um, there's obviously an attempt to profit from it. I'm not, that doesn't necessarily come directly from Craig, though. Um, it it has to do with um, uh, the revenue model that you select around uh, pushing the, the the code out into the into the business world. Are you going to I don't think a software license fee is appropriate. I think that you could have you could have transaction fees. You could also have certain protocols that you release for free, enable to enable the other side of what you're trying to develop. I'll, I'll give you an example on that because with uh, what we've seen lately with smart contracts and Ethereum, um, it, it, it's entirely possible through changes in the Bitcoin scripting language. Uh, using uh, multi-signature technology to use Bitcoin for a, a good portion of what Ethereum was attempting to do. Um, and there's companies that are developing this technology, such as Rootstock Labs. Um, if we can get to that point, then we start to see the Bitcoin protocol as a, a protocol battle or a protocol war where Ethereum, things like Ethereum and Bitcoin are definitely competitors because they're fighting for who is going to build that global, um, that global security protocol infrastructure. And the successful investors in this space are going to be the ones that see the, the Bitcoin protocol uh, in, in the way that you look at TCP IP um, or, or the way that you look at, at any other um, protocols that have a first mover advantage um, that benefit from the network effect. Um, and, and this is what gets the VC community so excited about Bitcoin, is they see it as the next uh, TCP IP, uh, uh, voice over IP. And the, the work that has been coming from these patents are the building blocks around that um, that can push that out to the entire world. Um, but there's, there's nothing at all decided on how one company can profit from it. 
it, 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 you, have to, you have to balance that against what you're releasing in open source. So it seems to me that there's this big claim. I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot to profit from if you can um, launch a legitimate claim to being Satoshi in that case. Um, why do you think so much of the community haven't bought the story and still to this day are very skeptical? I mean, is this a vested interest thing now? Or what's your interpretation of why he was not, why he was effectively rejected, I would argue? Well, I think it's, it's what you said up front, very specifically. It's the, uh, there was no demonstration made to the public at large. Um, you know, things that, uh, things that Gavin witnessed, things that I witnessed, were, were on an individual level. So they were nothing that, that we could repeat. Um, and, and by the way, Gavin has... Is that not somewhat ironic? But, but Gavin has not retracted his claims on that either. Right. Um, okay. And, and it's not ironic if So you, we have to trust you. You do have to trust me, but I'm not trying to be a disciple. No, fair enough. Now, um, I want to invite... Is it okay to invite some questions from the audience? Are you okay with that or...? Uh, yeah, I am okay with that. Okay. But, but before you do, I wanted mm -hmm. to say one additional thing Please because do. I didn't finish answering your question about, oh, about why people are skeptical. Um, if you notice, a lot of the skepticism, especially the vitriol, has come from the, the people in the Bitcoin community that have the most to lose by the, the Satoshi coming out. Um, uh, specifically, um, uh, people like Gregory Maxwell at uh, Blockstream. Um, they won't be seen in the same light uh, if the, the real original Satoshi is out. Um, and, and it'll be a, an effective counterweight to uh, this mantle of authority that they've been claiming. So you have to really look at the agenda of the people who are trying to dispute this, with the evidence or not. Good point. Um, are there any questions in the audience? Hands up. That chap there with the beard seems very keen. Um, is there a mic? <clears throat> com is a mic coming? No Satoshi questions. <laughs> no Satoshi questions. I will filter these questions. Hi. If they're um, inappropriate, I will intervene. Okay. Um, Izzy, this is a question you've asked on Alphaville a couple of times that I found. Can't hear you very well. I can't hear. Um, this is a question, Izzy, that you've asked on Alphaville a couple of times that I think is sort of quite pertinent um, for commercialization of Bitcoin. But who maintains the ledger for all of these big bank financial applications for the... Um, distributed blockchain, and why do they do that, and why do people trust them with that ledger? Was the question, who, can you repeat the question? I think he said, who maintains the ledger for these distributed um, blockchains, um, but I didn't catch the last point. Could you just... So who maintains the ledger of these new revolutionary technologies, um, and why do end users end up trusting them more than the existing kind of private right. ledger system? Well, so how is it yeah. different to the current system in the long run? Well, if you're talking about the private uh, permissioned closed blockchains, um, then there isn't much of a difference to, to the current system. Um, but that's, that's different from a permissionless open blockchain uh, such as Bitcoin. Um, there's, there's a proof of work consensus that is done, in, and the blocks that are built upon that are... Um, aggregate versions, uh, they're, they're, you're building upon history. So it's, it's an open protocol where um, it's permissionless as opposed to the closed uh, permissioned protocols of the blockchains that you're talking about. Those aren't even, you know, they're, they're, they can be thought of as centralized in, in, in a much um, uh, easier way. Does that answer your question? Um. I mean, I'd like to just jump in with a question. Who's got the next question? Okay, there's a question right up front in the white, but I'm going to quickly jump in with my question in the, as the mic is going there. Uh, John, because um, you and I, are, it's, it's, we've developed a funny relationship in so much as your enemy's enemy is your friend, and um, I'm one of the few people who's critical of Bitcoin, but I'm also quite crit critical of the private blockchain movements. Um, and I was just wondering, what, could you tell us why you are so adamant that the alternative private ledgers systems that are being, or the distributed multi-ledger private, some, sometimes public, but over many geographies, I don't know, whatever the buzzword is at the moment. Why, what, what do you uh, critique about them? Well, it's, it, it boils down to the word permission, um, because uh, it, it creates a gatekeeper. Um, at some point. So 
if you're creating a gatekeeper on who's deciding the permissioning, um, then you have uh, an opportunity for abuse and, and you have an opportunity for, for censorship. Uh, as opposed to a public blockchain, transactions on a private blockchain can be, can be uh, blocked, they can be revoked, they can be modified. Um, and unfortunately, what we're seeing now in the financial world is the development of a lot of uh, consortiums directed at the permissioned private blockchain world. Um, and you've referred to it in your articles even. I mean, uh, this is creating a, a mini cartel um, and the participants are largely the people from, the, the institutions from the legacy world. But I've even seen instances with some of these consortiums that uh, valid players are being blocked from even participating in the consortium. So how can you have an open consortium if you're blocking who's even in the consortium? I mean, you're not even a full-blown cartel yet. <laughs> I, I, I tend to agree. So the question at the front. Um, it took 200 years for America to hit the debt ceiling showdown and for essentially financial governance in the United States to be seen as slightly crap. Uh, in Bitcoin, it's been around for less than a decade, and yet it's already got incredibly crippling governance issues, largely related to the, the uh, block size. How is that not uh, existentially damning for the currency and its governance? Is history repeating itself, but much more quickly? Well, I, I think you're pointing to the success of Bitcoin in a short period of time, a seven-year span. Um, uh, it, it's been the most successful uh, digital currency ever uh, with, with the largest market cap. Um, the scalability issues will be solved. Um, I, I definitely don't think that, that Bitcoin's dead. I definitely don't think that Bitcoin's going away. Um, and, and, and just like we scaled the, the early internet, um, Bitcoin will, the scaling process will be gradual. It won't happen all at once. It won't happen on one day where you flip a switch. Um, now, on the existential part of your question, um, I, I think you were talking about, correct me, but I think you were talking about trusting Bitcoin in the same way that you trust uh, fiat? No, not at all. No, it was, it was far more the fact that when those scaling issues hit, the, the governance of Bitcoin fell apart, and we came into 2016 with incredibly nasty arguments on all sides, which well, didn't lead okay. to action in any effective way. No, I, I understand what you're saying now. The, the, um, there, there is effectively no government of Bitcoin. So, I mean, that's a misnomer to think that there's a government of Bitcoin. Unlike no Ethereum. Governance. Pardon? No government, I think he said. Governance. Oh, yeah, or government, okay, or, or even, even governance. But it, it, it performed exactly as designed. Um, and I know that's uh, taking a shortcut answer, but the ultimate governance of Bitcoin is played out through software propagation wars. If you want to change the Bitcoin core protocol, you have to change it through software propagation. And Bitcoin was designed to be very uh, inherently difficult to change that way. It, it's possible. It's not impossible, but it almost it, it, it's it's a overwhelming uh, majority of change to be able to affect something like that. Um, and, and that was as designed. I don't see it as a governance problem. I see it as a successful uh, a warding off of an attack. So there you go. Um, sadly, we've run out of time, uh, but I'm sure maybe John is still around um, as we get off. But quickly, uh, quick fire, the halving is what's gonna happen. Like, to, to, is it gonna be good or bad? <laughs> it's, going to, it's going to be short-term bad for miners, but it's going to be ultimately good for the price. Uh, so I don't, like Brexit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, and I don't think we'll see any, any real um, major change in the hash rate computational power. And you, you are still committed to your declaration that Craig Wright is Satoshi, yes or no? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, John. It's been real, really great having you here uh, explaining your point of view on all this. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Sure. Thank you for the book. Thank you very much.